Ay bich bin ich, weil du bist du, und du bist du, weil ich bin ich, bin ich nicht ich, und du bist nicht du. Aber ay bich bin ich, weil ich bin ich, und du bist du, weil du bist du, bin ich ich, und du bist du. Und wir können an eben schmusen. If I am I, because you are you, and you are you, because I am I, then I am not I, and you are not you. But if I am I, because I am I, and you are you, because you are you, then I am I, and you are you. And now we can begin to argue. So in life we need not only love and grace and attachment and affection, we also need discipline and severity and borders and boundaries. The question is, yes, in life or in business or in relationships, you have to know how to say yes, and you also have to know how to say no. And some people argue that those who don't know how to say no also don't know how to say yes. Because the only reason they're saying yes is because of guilt or shame or fear or insecurity or pettiness. So even when they say yes, they don't mean yes. It's just they're scared to say no. So only if you know how to say no do you know how to say yes. Think about it. And while you're thinking, I'm going to move on. And that is, we have to know how to say yes and we have to know how to say no. The question is, which quality, which attribute should dominate in our life? Which should be predominant in a classroom, in a home... In a school, in any environment where people get together, which one should predominate? Chesed, love, or gvura, strength? Come the laws of Kashrut and say, you need both love and strength. But love must always prevail and be the predominant force. Hence, if we eat meat first, think about it. So what's now at the foundation of our abdomen? Gvura, if you right away eat pizza, drink milk, have a cone of ice cream, or have a shtickle cheese lasagna, it's going on top of the gvura, so to speak. Hence, tata gavar, that which is on the bottom is the foundation that prevails. The gvura will prevail over the chesed. The chesed will become subservient to the gvura. Not good, you're not kosher. If it's the other way around, on the other hand, you drink milk. So now the foundation of your system is saturated with chesed, with love. Now afterwards, if you have a shtickle meat, so the gvura is secondary, subservient to the chesed, that works in the psychology of the biblical imagination. Chesed and gvura. So the next time, you made that bad mistake of eating Cholin Shabbos afternoon. So Saturday night there's no pizza. And thus it's 5 hours and 58 minutes. And you're thinking, does God really care <laughs> if I eat before 6 hours or not? Use that frustration as an energy to invite a meditation on the balance between love and discipline you're experiencing with your children. We know you're a great disciplinarian mother. Are your children also getting the nurture and love as much or more than the discipline or conversely? And the same, of course, with a father. Which brings us to subject number two, and that's fish. Fish. <coughs> fish is a very, very interesting food, of course. And for fish to go kosher, Rabbi Labovic informs me, they need two signs, fins and scales, right? Snapper and cascasses, fins and scales. Why? Why fins and scales? Here is the Kabbalah again. Fins and scales represent two components in life. Fins allow the fish to swim far and cover great distances. They're like wings. They're wings of the fish. What do they represent psychologically? Fins represent, the Kabbalah says, ambition. The human drive to grow and grow and swim and cover. I am here today, but I must be at the other side of the ocean in a month from now or in a year from now. Those are the fins that propel and drive the human being to develop, to invent, to create, and so forth. And then there are scales. What are scales? Scales protect the fish. They are like the armor of the fish. They protect it from harm's way. 
And the Talmud makes a powerful observation based on the Bible. Any fish that has scales automatically has fins. But there are fish that have fins and don't necessarily have scales. What's so fascinating is that Moses knew this 3,000 years ago. Now if I would have been Moses, I would have never written such a scientific fact. You have to be a fool to write it. Because did Moses really check out every fish in the world? He could have had reality spit him in the face and show him that there are fish that have scales and don't have fins. And yet 3,000 years later, we have discovered hundreds of thousands or millions new species of fish I never found. This statement in Talmud tractate Chulin, been disproved. Every fish that has scales has fins, but not every fish that has fins has scales. What does this represent emotionally? If fins represent ambition, scales represent integrity. Yiras Shamayim, fear of heaven. It's not about ambition, it's about a strong value system that protects you in the tumultuous pressures of life, not to cheat, not to betray, not to deceive. Fins are ambition, scales are integrity. If you have scales, you almost probably develop fins. But you may have fins and not have scales. There are people that are very ambitious, but unscrupulous. If you teach your child to have integrity, honesty, truth, ultimately he will develop or she will develop fins as well. So what are the kosher signs of fish? Again, when we eat fish, it becomes part of our system. What makes it kosher is two qualities. Number one, scales which represent an absolute set of values, of integrity, of honesty, which are the scales that protect us from the pressures and temptations and addictions in life. And yet Judaism doesn't only ask for honesty, integrity, and be a passive, obedient, good robot. But it also says part of being kosher is fins. Because as much as God wants us to have integrity and honesty, He also wants a person should develop their skills, maximize their potentials, be as creative as they can, and cover distances that nobody ever covered, the sky or beyond the sky being the limit. Two examples of the kosher laws, among so many others, meat and milk and fins and scales, which which we study them, reflect upon them, we discover layers upon layers of psychological, emotional, spiritual and biological significance. Hence, the powerful fact That three and a half thousand years ago when the laws of kosher were given, three and a half thousand years later in 2008, they still maintain the same, they still retain the same vigor, the same relevance, the same depth, the same meaning, and the same powerful application, only growing from day to day, and according to the video, from hour to hour, especially with an organization like this, headed by our dear friend, Rabbi Lubavik, who went to Kasher House, I see he's not here. I guess he was just called to Kasher House, somewhere in Crown Heights, perhaps, because he's gone, okay? He's a loyal guy. He doesn't even have time for his own dinner. And so, this is what we are commemorating tonight and celebrating tonight. And so, my dear friends... I want to conclude with the story about a Jewish woman who sees that her husband is very, very overworked, stressed out, looks sick. He looks sick. She takes him to the doctor. Of course, the best doctor. He had an MC tonight. She takes him to the doctor. The doctor checks him out, sends him out of the room. The doctor calls her into his office and says, Mrs., your husband is very, very stressed out.